Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Navigating the COVID-19 Crisis. This is the seventh webinar in a series that CASE has been providing uh, to educators, administrators across the nation. Um, today, we continue to have our distinguished panel of presenters uh, with us, and we'll do introductions in, in just a moment. But I do want to walk through the agenda with you and um, share what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, uh, after welcome and introductions, we're going to review our four priorities and some very specific do's and don'ts based on information that we've been hearing from the field. You'll hear some updates from Washington, which are vital for you to hear today, especially with regard to the Secretary's uh, recommendations and what those next steps are. Uh, moving forward, again, we're going to talk uh, specifically about ESY and compensatory education, data and goal progress. Again, based on some information we've been hearing from the field and uh, what we believe uh, is important information to share with you. And we'll also take questions. Uh, there will be some poll questions at the end that we really uh, want your feedback on as well. So we'll move on into introductions. Uh, with us today is Aaron McGuire, our case president from Vermont. Uh, Myrna Mandlowitz, our case policy and legislative consultant from Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Kevin Rubenstein, the case policy and legislative chair from Illinois. Julie Weatherly with resolutions and special education from Alabama. Uh, and I'm Phyllis Wolfram, your case executive director. Moving on to the next slide, I want to remind you to use the hashtag we keep leading. Uh, if you will continue to as you tweet out throughout the webinar and actually as you're tweeting out throughout the week and you're providing information, uh, resources as you're sharing with your colleagues, uh, updating, sharing the good things that you're doing in your school districts, uh, we want to hear from you. So please continue to use we keep leading throughout the week uh, as you uh, tweet out those wonderful things happening. The information that we're providing to you today is the best we know at this moment. You've heard us say that, but uh, you're in the trenches. You know things are changing every day and sometimes every hour in your school districts. And it might change by the end of this webinar. It could change next week. But today we're going to state some specific guidance, uh, which we believe uh, you need to review and, uh, and understand. So, uh, Starting uh, first and foremost, I uh, would like to introduce who I'll be co-presenting a section of this with today, uh, Julie Weatherly. Um, and um, she's, uh, you know, of course, uh, most of you know Julie and I are sisters. Uh, I think my hair is usually a little bit bigger than hers on some days, but she still has the thicker accent. So um, good afternoon, Julie. How are you? Great, Phyllis. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to start, Julie, with just the first priority, uh, just reviewing all four of them really quick. This is not a new slide to those of you who have been joining us for our webinars. Um, number one, to focus on the safety, health, and welfare of uh, students and staff in your community. To provide faith, deliver services to as many students as you reasonably can in the best way you know how. To document your efforts, make sure your documentation is focused, consistent, detailed, demonstrates that good faith effort. And number four, compliance. We all know that IDEA was not built for this. Julie and I are now gonna go into some very specifics about, again, some things we've been hearing, uh, relating those to our four priorities uh, and share with you some do's and don'ts. Number one is, as we are again, focusing uh, on the safety and the health of our students, our staff and those in our community. One, we we want to advise you to continue to follow the rules that the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, uh, lays out for us, for your safety, for the health uh, of you and your students. And the state guidance documents, even during the summer as you're preparing for ESY and as the reopening, those are things that you do want to follow and stay on top of. You do want to plan for possible challenges with health and the welfare uh, in, in the long term. Uh, ask yourself, what are those questions that you need to answer that you'll be facing? You're already having those uh, daily, weekly conversations with your families and your students. So anticipate what some of those challenges might be 
uh, in the long term. And as we, we do return to whatever our new normal is uh, in the future. And then focus on mental health for your staff and for your students. And what are you doing to keep the balance? And are you checking in with your staff? And are you checking in with your families around what their needs are? And are they keeping that balance as well? Julie? Thanks, sis. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm always really glad when we start with this one because it is so important as a priority and that legal is, is number four in terms of compliance. And so we always need to keep that in mind because this is clearly a safety health emergency and courts are always going to acknowledge that that was the circumstance that everybody was in. So of course the lawyer gets the don'ts because I'm always telling people what not to do. So my don'ts in this category of uh, number one priority, I do find it traditional uh, in a way that most of my clients when planning for ESY services particularly tend to bring populations of vulnerable children together. Because as we all know, our vulnerable children, most severely and profoundly disabled, typically are the ones that are in need of extended school year services. Obviously, we don't make any blanket decisions on that, but they're going to be, in many cases, the most vulnerable. So they may be the less likely that you would gather in groups when you're starting to see your school buildings opening. Another don't that I have here is please don't turn to your special ed lawyer for answers about when it is appropriate to bring students back on campus. That is starting across the country I and mean, some have already decided we're probably not going to see bringing students on campuses over the summer, but I'm seeing others just making the decision that yeah we're going to do that and calling me and saying is that okay. And I have to say, I'm not the expert in the CDC guidelines and the local and state health agencies. You need to rely on them in making those decisions. So us special ed lawyers typically, unless we have credentials like Dr. Fauci, are not going to be able to help with that. Phyllis? Okay, moving on to priority number two, uh, providing faith. Uh, deliver services to as many students as you reasonably can in the best way that you know how. So continue to provide those services uh, through remote learning uh, as you can. We know that remote learning has been a challenge for some of our school districts, but we uh, encourage you to continue to make gains and move toward uh, as much remote learning as you possibly can. To provide those extended school year services as you typically would have, just provide them virtually. At this point, the CDC is continuing to recommend distancing and that we're not interacting. Um, again, that might be a little different from state to state. So it's looking at what your state guidelines are, maybe even, even your county guidelines uh, uh, regarding uh, social distancing. We will talk more extensively. You'll hear Aaron and Kevin talk about ESY and specifically when and how. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And then make services and supports individualized for students with disabilities. It's important as we talk about free and appropriate public education and individualized education programs, our IEPs, that we continue to look at the individual needs of our students. Julie? All right, so the don'ts in this category, and I'd like to preface this one with please, please don't ask parents to sign what we refer to here as FAPE waivers. There are a couple of stories that we've been hearing about where parents are being asked to sign away the right to challenge the school district in any way, to file for due process in exchange for the child's ability to participate in online speech services or other services listed in the IEP. And so there are a couple of, I would say, unfortunate articles that have been written about this so uh, if you're doing that, please um, talk with your counsel, make sure you really review that and ensure that it's not going to be construed by advocates as a waiver of FAPE rights. The second don't, don't decide you'll just handle things through quote unquote comp ed. And uh, my colleagues, Kevin and uh, um, Aaron are gonna do a great job, I'm sure, with talking through this. We've talked through it before, I put comp ed in quotes because it has its connotations, but 
whatever that is, don't just assume you'll fall back on that in the fall. Obviously, it's probably a little on the late side to be talking about this one, but I am concerned that people are figuring that they'll just work it out as part of comp ed. First of all, we've got to understand what comp ed is all about in this context, but that's really not the way to handle it. I don't think that's going to be supportive of those good faith reasonable efforts to continue services for our students. And please don't stop reaching out to families, uh, even if they have disengaged with you. Keep, you know, not bothering them, but and early on parents made decisions in light of the fact that they may have lost their jobs, they didn't have time to worry about their children participating in any services. So continue to reach out to your families and please think about reaching out and continuing that process with, uh, with your gen ed folks. Uh, we focus so much on special education and those special ed services that are in IEPs, but most of the population participates to a good extent in the gen ed setting. This is not just a special education issue, particularly in the summer where you have some time to start collaborating about what your process is going to look like when you reopen. All right, back to you. All right, uh, number three, moving on to our third priority, uh, dealing with documenting your efforts, making sure that your documentation is focused, consistent, detailed, and that it demonstrates that good faith effort to provide good services. So one of the uh, do's is assist your teams in staying organized with all of the paperwork and the virtual records. For some of our staff that um, maybe are, are not feeling as competent in their technology skills and how to store records and maybe use Google Docs or uh, OneDrive or, or your preferred uh, systems in your school district, ensure that your paperwork is in order because that is going to be very important when we return and, and we know that we already are experiencing some concerns that are being raised maybe by some families or some advocacy groups. So we want to ensure that your paperwork is in order. We did do a video, um, a webinar video with Let's Go Learn, which is posted on our website on the COVID-19 tab, which will share with you some ideas about how to organize uh, your paperwork and, and your systems in general for special education. And uh, secondly, organize yourself and your team over the summer for what the fall will look like, um, evaluations, meetings, it, it will give you some time, those of you who might not be involved in extended school year services to, to a deep level, but to really bring in some staff uh, and begin to talk about how do we get organized? Uh, how do we structure initial evaluations, especially if we're still distance learning? Uh, how do we wanna handle that? How do we wanna handle those IEP meetings uh, that we need to be having? So it just gives you a, a little bit of a break to start planning. Julie? All right, so let's make sure that we all don't force ourselves to rely on our memory during this period of time. I don't know about you all, but I can't remember what day it is most of the time. I'm happy today's Friday. I looked at the calendar this morning, went yay, but still it bleeds into Saturday, Sunday. There doesn't seem to be any stop to all of this, and it's very scary. And I can't remember what I did yesterday. So Let's don't force ourselves to rely on our memories. And that's why us lawyer types like that whole motto of document, document, document. Count on others to help you share ideas with respect to organization and having a good plan of organization. Um, hopefully you've already had that in place, but let's talk about continuing that. And don't plan to organize yourself later. Oh, I'll get that stack of documents over there in the corner. Uh, ready when when you know the time comes and when things get back to quote unquote normal. I don't know when that's going to be. I really don't feel like we're going to see normal whatever and however you define that whatever that is. But bottom line is you need to do it now. Continue to be organized and continue to just move forward in an organized fashion. All right. So then our fourth priority, um, talking about compliance during the pandemic. Uh, and you've heard us say IDEA was not built for this. It was not. It's very difficult, some of the tasks that we have before us. 
but do continue to comply with meeting notification requirements in the best way that you know how. Communication with your parents and then back to documenting is important. Attempt to meet those timelines as best as possible. When you're not meeting them, document why you're not meeting them, what is occurring, what are the circumstances under which you're working, and then follow through with your state guidance documents. Uh, if, you're, if you're complying with those, uh, those are in accordance with the federal guidelines. Our states are required to do that. So continue to stay in touch with your state departments. Continue to collaborate effectively with them uh, so that you're all on the same page. And last but not least, don't. And one I'm not very pleased to have to actually share with you because everyone is worried about these compliance issues. And I know that. And they are very important. So the dues are very important to keep in mind. But at this point in time, notwithstanding our best efforts, I would say don't count on any flexibilities coming at least anytime soon from Congress. Um, we're, we're still working at it, um, making those really good faith efforts to try to get those flexibilities in place so that we don't have to worry about corrective action and enforcement and all of those kinds of things that are sure to occur, occur if we don't get flexibility, but don't count on it. Just move forward and don't think about it much, much further. And speaking of Congress, I'm now going to turn things over to my esteemed colleague, Myrna Mandlowitz, to fill you in on what's going on in Washington. Thanks, Julie. I really appreciate it. Uh, happy to be with everyone again this week. Uh, let's plow right in here. We've got lots to cover today. Uh, first of all, just to talk for a minute about uh, why flexibilities are needed and in wh where those flexibilities are needed. So as you know uh, very well as uh, local directors and other people who work in school districts, the IDEA requires that the federal government monitor compliance on the IDEA, uh, monitor states on compliance, and in turn, the states monitor the local school districts. And it's all around those process pieces. And those pieces, as you can see, are things such as uh, completion of initial evaluations on based on the timelines, annual reviews of IEPs, uh, resolution of parent complaints, all of which are very prescribed in the IDEA. It was, Matter of fact, I was looking back through my copy of the statute today and for the first time ever noticed in the margin where it points out the deadlines, that is the timelines, of which there are many in this law. So also in turn, the state must submit uh, information to the Department of Education, which is based on the information that they collect from the local school districts. And it goes through the state performance plan and that plan is used to evaluate the state's efforts to implement the requirements and the purposes of the law. And it also describes how the state will improve its implementation. So this is a law that's all very focused on uh, procedural compliance. And I think that's one thing we've always heard when we think about uh, due process hearings. Is it a substantive complaint or is it a procedural complaint? And a lot of it really focuses on that process. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, so we have been talking very much in case and we have been describing this to you over the last several weeks about supporting flexibility. And we want to emphasize and have emphasized to both the Secretary of Education and Congress that these are temporary and targeted flexibilities we are asking for. Uh, please go back if you haven't already and familiarize yourself what's in our letter to Congress and the department. Uh, we talk in there about targeted and temporary flexibilities in the areas of timelines, and procedure and also in fiscal management. And it would really be great for you all to familiarize yourself with what we call in Washington the asks, those requests that we are making, uh, because we hope that we will be calling on you soon to help us get this message across and maybe help us get over the finish line with some of these requests for flexibilities. We wanna reiterate that CASE has not asked for waivers of the IDEA 
We have not used that word. We are not asking for changes in the law. We are asking for temporary and targeted flexibility. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we, we were waiting for with great anticipation uh, since the CARES Act was passed at the end of March was a report from Secretary DeVos to Congress. She was required to submit looking at any possible waivers as the, uh, as the report language said in the Every Student Succeeds Act, in the IDEA, and in the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. And of course, our focus at CASE was really on the IDEA and what she might be asking. Uh, the secretary issued her recommendations this past Monday. You can read those online, the Department of Education website. Uh, recommendations for flexibilities. She did not ask for support for any blanket waivers, and she is not, the reports noted that she was not requesting, quote, waiver authority for any of the core tenants of the IDEA or Section 504, uh, support, uh, specifically FAPE in the least restrictive environment. What she did ask for regarding IDEA was one of the recommendations that actually we had in our letter, which was a flexibility in the transition timeline uh, from Part C, infants and toddlers, to the Part B preschool program. Interestingly, they cited three sections of the law uh, when they wrote about this particular uh, request for, flex for a waiver and the waiver authority for the secretary. And the three sections of the law were these. First, they asked for a, uh, they cited the transition from Part C to preschool, uh, which as you will know, says that by the third birthday, an IEP or an IFSP must be developed and implemented. They also asked, interestingly, for a, they cited also the uh, section 612A9, which, uh, excuse me, 614A, which is the 60-day timeline for initial evaluation. And that's the section that covers initial evaluation for all kids for the K-12 uh, Part B program. Uh, the one thing that they did not clarify was whether they were asking for flexibility, as Case did in its letter, for uh, flexibility in the timeline for all initial evaluations. It seems from the context they were using this only for the C to B transition, but they really did not clarify that. So I think that's one area that they need to look back and make sure that we understand what it is they're asking. Uh, the third thing, third area of the law they cited was the 90 day timeline to transi transition students from part C to part B. The report says this, it says that the waiver would give the secretary authority to extend the IDEA B transition evaluation timelines, that is the part B initial evaluation. So the timeline would start no later than the day on which face-to-face -face meetings can resume and the toddler can be evaluated. The language would also give explicit authorization for Part C services to continue during the timeline delay so the child could continue to get those Part C services after his or her third birthday and until the Part B evaluation was done and eligibility is determined. I want to re remind you, and please note on this slide, that it says that the secretary issued recommendations. The, these were simply that. She sent a report to Congress with her recommendation for flexibility in this particular timeline. And now it's up to Congress to do the work of determining what flexibilities they would like to include in the final package that they're going to do next in Congress. So thus far, there have been no changes to any timelines in the IDEA from the Department of Education. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Um, while, that, while this was going on, um, very interesting that CASE has been having a number of conversations with members of Congress. Two of the people that we've spoken to or their staff members are Senator Cassidy from Louisiana, a Republican, and Senator Murphy, a Democrat from Connecticut. 
Shortly after our conversations with those two Senate staff, Senate offices, uh, those two members came out with a joint statement that they sent to the secretary offering their plan for narrow, temporary, and targeted flexibilities. You may remember that those temporary and targeted flexibilities are the words that CASE has been using from the outset. And they outlined five principles, uh, and some of this may sound familiar to you as well. And the five principles they outlined in their letter asking for narrow, temporary, and targeted flexibilities included first, to preserve the right to FAPE for students with disabilities through this time when schools are closed and to support quote, creative remedies to lost learning once school reopens. So again, reiterating that we nor they are asking for waivers of the main parts of the IDEA or for waivers of any of the law. Second, the two senators asked to keep additional flexibilities in any timeline requirements quote, narrow, targeted, and temporary, while keeping the other requirements to provide FAPE and, to engage, and the other requirements to engage parents in the process and ensure due process. Again, the same kinds of things that CASE has been requesting. Third, they ask that, that congressional and department oversight and accountability for the law be maintained. Fourth, they requested that the department communicate the current flexibilities in, clear, timely, in a clear and timely manner through guidance and more actively providing technical assistance to states and districts. And last, they asked that there be more, more funding provided, of course, this is from Congress, to states and to school districts to, fund, to supplement current IDEA funding so that learning can be maintained and additional services can be provided once schools reopen. And they cited requests from schools and advocates, including the fact that CASE has signed on to a number of these letters, asking for at least an additional $10 billion for IDEA going forward, additional to what the normal appropriations would be. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, just to remind you, we talked about this a bit last week, uh, but I want to update you on where we are with the funding from the CARES Act. And that was that big 30 plus billion dollar pot of money that was divided up among elementary and secondary education, the governor's relief fund, and another pot of money for higher education. As of yesterday, 16 states had applied for what's called the ESSER money, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, and 11 states have already received their money. Uh, the, the Council of Chief State School Officers represents the state superintendents and commissioners, is very interested to know when this money is getting to states, if there are any lags in that money getting to local school districts. So please uh, keep us posted if you hear once your state gets its money, um, if there's any problem, because that money is supposed, supposed to flow very quickly down to the local school district level. The department so far is doing a very good job of turning the applications around just within days to get these dollars out the door from the U.S. Department of Education to the State Departments of Education. As noted, 30, 11 states have already gotten their money. Regarding that governor's emergency relief fund, I think I mentioned last week that the governors are looking at that pot of money as money that will fill gaps once the states get their money from the emergency elementary and secondary emergency relief fund and the higher education institute, institutions get their money. Um, they are looking very carefully. They've been getting a lot of requests, as you can imagine, from different corners asking for that money to be targeted to different programs in the education departments. And the governors are trying to very carefully figure out how best to use these dollars because they are concerned that this may be the only money that they see. They have no guarantee, just as um, no one does, that there will be additional dollars coming from Congress. We certainly hope there will be, but they want to target that money very carefully uh, to fill gaps where necessary in the K-12 arena and also in higher ed. 
One of the other big concerns now that has emerged is the fact that, of course, state and local revenues are dipping precipitously given the fact that all the businesses are closed and there are few tax, fewer tax revenues coming in. So groups like the Council of uh, Great City Schools, which represents all the large urban school districts in the country, and another, a number of other um, heavy hitter education groups in Washington uh, have been talking to Congress about the critical need for federal support as these other pots of money will de decline and continue to decline for a while. Um, on average, about 7% about of local school district budgets is, uh, is from federal funding, and the rest comes, as you know, from state and local revenues. So there is really a need to shore up uh, the federal funding as those other pots of money decline. But we can move to the final slide. Uh, there are, continue to be, and, and Case is very much in the mix in this, asking for more money as Congress considers another stimulus package. Uh, it looks like that possibly within the next two weeks, the House could present a draft bill, uh, maybe as early as the week of May 11th. But we're also hearing that the education numbers that we've been requesting are not near uh, the levels that we would hope for. So there's going to continue to be a great need for more advocacy. First of all, uh, the last package, the CARES Act, did not target funding. It just has that large K-12 uh, K-12 pot of money. So we would very much like to see dollars specifically targeted to the IDEA, to ESSA, and some other areas. There has also been a very big push, and CASE has also been in the middle of this, on getting more money for the E-rate, which is a program that's administered through the Federal Communications Commission, to get folks and school districts online where they do not have access to the internet. So there is a very large push now also in that area. And another area of deep concern are the higher ed institutions that are suffering greatly through all of this as well. So I am going to now turn it over to Erin and Kevin, and we'll look forward to your questions as we go forward. Verna, as always, thank you so much for that amazing detail and uh, important information from Washington. It really helps us put into context the work that we do at the local level um, and helps us know what to expect as we go forward. Um, Kevin is going to come on with me, I think, in just a moment. And while we are not siblings, um, as uh, we don't. We didn't dress in the same color like uh, Phyllis and Julie. We have been spending lots and lots of time together, and uh, it looks like Kevin. I am now seeing a different part of your screen than I was before, which Sorry. means that the presentation go back. Yep. go back up. Awesome. Your tulips are beautiful, though. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, to get us started, uh, I'd like to just um, bring us to the next slide, which will look familiar to many of you. We wanted to spend some time reminding you of um, the uh, ways to think about extended school year services given COVID-19 um, and the school closures. So first a reminder that between um, now and the end of school, it's important that you're analyzing data to consider who is which students are and are not eligible for extended school year services. Again, as a reminder, every state is different as it relates to extended school year. So it's hard for us to um, say anything other than go ahead and use your state guidelines related to making those decisions. Many of those uh, constructs are about regression analysis. And so thinking about regression for students when they are um, away in the summer is the appropriate process to go through um, if that's what your state guidelines call for. And some of you, many of you, I know this applies to me, we've, we had made many decisions about extended school year services for students prior to the events of COVID-19 and school closure. So those decisions continue to be available to us to consider. 
Um, we want you, though, also to think about any changes that have happened for students related to their IEP progress between school closure and the end of the year. Kevin's going to talk a little bit about benchmarking progress as it relates to that in a bit. Um, and it's important that you remember that the data that you uh, had prior to departure and the as it compares to the data at the end of the year helps you better understand the impact of COVID-19, we really, and the school closures on students with disabilities, that we believe that information will be very important to all of us as we think about the larger impacts of COVID-19 for students with disabilities. Um, but that is not necessarily required for purposes of ESY decisions. We want to make that clear that those are two different pieces of the puzzle, um, but they're both important and you really want to make sure you have that information. Um, and then this summer, it's important that in some way you implement your extended school year services that you've determined are necessary under the under FAPE for students under their IEPs. And so we're encouraging you to go ahead and implement those services. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the logistics of that next and um, continue to think about this issue of COVID-19 impact. We did want to also share with you that uh, we've heard of several districts and um, and uh, and even some states that are thinking about how to support the impact of COVID-19 using some of the CARES funds or other funds that might be available for all students. And um, COVID-19 COVID and school closure has impacted everyone, certainly. And so thinking about that and how that will be resolved is really important. Um, Julie and um, Phyllis mentioned the importance of your collaboration with your general education colleagues and your curriculum directors, your superintendents, your principals, um, as well as special educators and classroom teachers collaborating and thinking about how are we going to address the impact of COVID-19 for all students and making sure that centered in that is are the needs of students with disabilities and what they need um, if you're addressing impact for all students. And then um, over the summer, we also encourage you to plan for the return in the fall um, and to really assess students and that may or may not change FAPE for students upon return. Um, so those are all important constructs. And I'm gonna um, offer an opportunity for Kevin for any other comments you'd like to make on this slide and then continuing on into the next slide around logistics for ESY. Right, so really three areas of data collection that um, people or three things that people need to be thinking about here and they don't necessarily coincide with this slide, but um, three things that people need to be thinking about here are ESY is um, sort of one uh, data collection bucket and that would really be in the uh, green area over there um, on the left side of the screen. And uh, that's the typical data collection that we that everybody is doing and um, really what, what does that look like and um, all of those other sorts of things. Another um, sort of bit of data collection that everybody should be doing is um, looking at uh, the, um, you know, our favorite dance is the COVID slide, um, like the electric slide, but the COVID slide. Um, so the COVID slide, and um, so that would be um, probably the blue area in the middle. Um, and really, what does that look like? And then um, the last area of things that you uh, need to be considering here are, and it doesn't really necessarily coincide with the red, but it is in that time frame of the red that you're going to be um, thinking about it. It's actually um, further off than that is um, just the compensatory. Um, if there are going to be claims for compensatory and what does that look like? So I'm going to move on um, and think, uh, help you think through a little bit of the ESY logistics because I can tell you that um, oftentimes people ask me, hey, Kevin, how do you have all of this time to do all this work? And I say, well, actually, uh, it, um, it, falls right in line with the regular work that I do in my own school district. So as I have been thinking about things in my own school district and then tossing ideas around with some other people, um, we wanted to offer some design principles and some thoughts for you about extended school year. So first of all, we just wanted to remind you um, that uh, you shouldn't be using ESY uh, as a catch-all. So um, uh, as soon as you put extended school year in somebody's IEP, 
Um, uh, it is really something that may be difficult to get out of their IEP um, in future years and those sorts of things. So you're probably not going to want to put it uh, in there for every single student um, as a means of sort of catching everybody up from the COVID slide, um, those sorts of things, or as a means of providing extra services, uh, as Aaron talked about, possibly through the CARES Act, those sorts of things. Don't, you don't want to be doing that. Um, and then you're gonna wanna think about the four priorities uh, that we talked about before. So as you're thinking about um, the health, uh, life and safety of um, the students and staff in your buildings, are you gonna wanna do it in person um, if you can, um, or are you gonna wanna do it uh, virtually? So um, in Illinois, where I'm at, we're still at uh, high risk. And so um, in my area, we have chosen um, all of the school districts in my special education cooperative have decided that we are going to be doing it virtually um, and so that is a decision that everybody made even though it is um, less than ideal we certainly understand that it's less than ideal and so um, but the health life and safety being the uh, number one priority for all of us um, as we put that out there from the very start um, that we wanted to make sure that uh, we capitalized on that um, you're going to need to think through, are you going to do this at the beginning of the summer um, or at the end of the summer? You know, um, there is nothing stopping you from um, doing it uh, at the end of the summer um, when things may have uh, cleared a little bit more. You may have staff who are a little bit more available and well rested, par uh, parents and families who um, are a little bit more well rested and may want to um, engage then at that time. Um, with some virtual learning. You may also be able to, um, you know, provide some different resources that were not available at the beginning of summer. Um, we know that, like, for example, in our school district, the, um, we're, we're planning for a couple of different scenarios for the fall. Um, and so as we think about those different scenarios about what um, the fall is going to look like, we know that an end of the summer sort of program could actually look um, a little bit better and a little bit different. And so you're going to want to think through the beginning of the summer versus the end of the summer. Um, you definitely want to provide FAPE um, based on individual needs and student circumstances. So um, one of the things that uh, really concerns me is, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier on in the webinar. Um, I, I have heard some people talking about, you know, maybe we just won't offer ESY this year. And um, that to me, um, folks out in webinar land, I, I've got to tell you that just makes my heart stop because um, that is setting us all up for um, really, really big claims um, in the future. Um, you're not providing FAPE. If you, if a student has ESY on their IEP um, and you're not providing ESY services um, at all, um, even in the midst of a pandemic, um, then that's setting you up for a FAPE claim. So provide FAPE based on the individual needs and the student circumstances in the best way you know how. Um, I would um, understand then if you would probably take uh, the individualized remote learning plans, maybe tailor them a little bit more um, and think through all of that with your classes um, and your teachers for the summer um, in your extended school year program but really focus on providing um, faith and making good faith efforts there. And then this last thing here, classes versus group. So you may have um, fewer parents and families who want to engage with you over the summer um, with related to, uh, related to ESY services. So um, you need to think through, is it worth it? You know, in our typical ESY program, we would put everybody into classes. Um, is it really worth it to uh, go through that um, sort of planning? Um, or should we just assign a group of students um, to an individual teacher and have that teacher engage with those students um, individually throughout the summer um, and maybe have them do some group work, um, but not you know, uh, whole class times uh, at different 
times throughout the summer. Um, so think through that. What does that look like? Does it depend on numbers? Um, do you have the staff to do that? What is What are all of those considerations that you need to think through um, in terms of those ESY logistics? You've really got to think this through um, as a special ed director, and there are a couple of things that you um, that are really going to fall on your shoulders. So um, that's what I've got in terms of those ESY logistics. Erin, anything to add there? Yeah, I think um, as a director, I am in the process of really trying to be quite creative as it relates to multiple plans. And so um, I am working hard not to create a scenario where I'm stuck in one avenue without the ability to change over time. We are in a time of change. Um, Vermont is opening up a little bit very slowly, but um, we have been less impacted by large numbers of COVID cases. And so for me, I'm using that to think about, it is possible that we may be able to do some summer programming in person. I don't know that yet. Um, but as an example, when I posted for the positions to ensure that I have staff, I made sure to include the idea that this could be either virtual or in person based on where we find ourselves. Um, I'm also thinking about how do I make a decision about who gets in-person services if not everyone can who's eligible right. for extended school year. And so thinking about what are those tenants? How would I decide that? What information would I use? What data would I use to help inform me in deciding which students would and would not? Staying always students and family centered in those decisions and being able to be flexible in them um, to the second bullet there at the beginning of the summer, maybe different at the end of the summer. Um, so those are all aspects that I'm thinking about in my own process that I wanted to share and hopefully are helpful. So I think we can move to the next slide, Kevin. Yep. So this is a topic that has been certainly a hot topic across this whole experience, which is this idea about compensatory education. And we just wanted to remind you that from a legal perspective, compensatory education is a legal remedy if the district does not provide a free appropriate public education to a student. There are a couple of things that we'd like to mention as it relates to this. First of all, um, as it relates to federal law, this is the requirement, and there are circumstances where different states are doing different things related to directing their uh, administrators regarding compensatory education. And so it's so important that you look to your state department along with anything that we're saying or you're reading at the federal level and putting it all together to make meaning for yourself in your circumstance. Um, but from a, an IDEA perspective, um, if you have provided clarity about what FAPE is and you have provided that during the pandemic, then compensatory education would be related to an allegation that you did not provide that FAPE. That goes back to what it means to offer FAPE. We need to be consistent in our application of due process rights and parental rights related to what we offer. OSEP has been very clear that FAPE is expected during this time. They did not say that FAPE needs to look exactly as it did during school. They didn't say that the IEP has to say exactly the same and no one may amend anything. That's not what was said. What was said is that you need to offer FAPE and FAPE is in the context of the individual circumstances of the student. And if you've analyzed that and you've thought carefully as a team with families about how you're going to offer FAPE during this time, compensatory education would be an analysis about whether or not you did that. If you are not providing anything, if you did not have quality conversations about what FAPE is under this circumstance for your individual students, and your IEP is sitting presently as it was without any addendum of a distance learning plan under the rules or without any changes to it at all related to the circumstance, that means you've obligated FAPE as it sat when you closed during this time. 
it's been made very clear that FAPE extends. Compensatory education is a claim that FAPE was not offered. And so FAPE will be what you've said it is and what the family has agreed to in this circumstance. Um, and so it's just really important to remember that. So wanted to make sure to be really clear about that. Um, and again, that is how we see it as case and how we see it under federal law and how we've talked about it with Julie Weatherly and you need to uh, relate all of that into whatever your state is also expecting. Um, we do not recommend that you offer, simply offer compensatory education as a solution to this situation. That is not what compensatory education was designed for. It's not how it's been used in the past. So we recommend that uh, you think about all of those points, make meaning for yourself, and absolutely consult your district attorney as as you think about these issues. Kevin, I'll hand it over to you to make any other comments that you'd like to and then move into a yeah. full progress. Yeah. No, that's really uh, great and very helpful. Um, I think that one of the other questions we've been getting a lot of lately is um, sort of what this final benchmark is going to look like, um, or as you saying to me last night, Aaron, the final countdown. Um, uh, it was so eloquent. I wish all of you could have been on the line. I'm not um, doing so, it on camera. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so um, just understanding the success of uh, distance or remote learning. So, um, you know, again, in my district, we are thinking through sort of what does this final benchmark look like as we look at um, goal updates. So, um, you know, we need to consider those assessment possibilities. So oftentimes we've aligned our IEP goals to um, a progress monitoring tool that um, we were regularly doing and those sorts of things. Well, we may not have collected that data during the time that we've been out of school. Um, so you need to think through what we have done uh, during the time that we've been out of school and been remote learning um, that you actually could um, use to assess that student. So um, if it's reading, is it possible for your student, uh, for your teachers to get um, uh, sort of an updated reading level um, in any way, shape, or form, informally or formally? Um, is it possible for you to do uh, sort of a running record or a Fountas and Pinnell benchmark, those sorts of things, um, through a virtual means or over the phone or something along those lines? Um, is that, are any of those sorts of things possible? So work through those assessment possibilities now um, and really look at what aligns to the goals and how you can gather that data. Um, then you've got to manage that data. Um, so you've got to think through, you usually probably print many of these goal updates. Uh, they uh, uh, usually, uh, you know, I know in my district, they get sent home with report cards. What does that really look like? We still need to provide those goal updates. Um, they uh, still need to go somewhere. Um, they still need to get all to a certain uh, place in your district where they're gonna go. Um, and so you need to think through how you're gonna manage that data, manage all that paperwork, um, manage all of that remotely. Um, again, my district um, and in my state right now, we still have a stay-at-home order until May 31st. So um, we're not able to even, you know, sort of go outside of our, um, go to the district, um, except for some of the other um, minor things until after that date at this point. So, um, so you need to think about what really looks like um, in your district. And you need to support your special educators um, related to analyzing that data um, to provide, uh, to help them to see what the COVID impact is going to be. Because let me just walk you through for just a quick second, because Aaron was talking about the compensatory for just a, um, a slide ago. Um, in the fall, what's going to happen is that um, I would say that um, when a parent requests um, compensatory education or they say that their student was underserved, um, you are going to be likely to say to them, um, I would encourage you to say to them, let's talk about that and let's have an IEP team meeting. And you're going to come together um, in your short time frame um, and have a meeting. And you are going to need to gather all of the data that you've gathered over this really, um, you know, short time frame. And all of this data is going to need to be 
uh, managed and well put together and well thought out um, that you are going to need to be able to very quickly pull together um, and show and demonstrate to the family just um, how well you served their child. And we know that everybody's working extraordinarily hard, but when we hear stories from across the country and lots of people, and even in my own district, of uh, people sort of saying, oh, I'm documenting that over here and I plan to transfer it over to that form that we created a little bit later on, it makes me really concerned because I know in my heart that that is never gonna happen. Um, and we need to make sure that everything gets to one place everything stays in one place every you know we all keep it together and help educators to analyze that data and and keep it all together there um so aaron why don't we move on to this next slide here um which is just our four priorities and a reiteration um i know that we're running a little bit short on time um and we want to be sure to get some to some questions um just a, a reminder here about those uh four priorities uh, for special education, and uh, we'll bring Phyllis and the rest of the crew back on, um, but uh, focus on the safety, health, and welfare of students, uh, staff, uh, uh, students and staff members in your community, provide FAPE, deliver services to as many students as you reasonably can in the best way you know how, um, document your efforts, make sure documentation is focused, consistent, detailed, and demonstrates a good faith effort to provide good services. And I would also add to that right now, just make sure that you know where all that documentation is and where you're keeping it and that it's organized. Um, and then the last one is compliance during the pandemic. Idea was certainly not built for this. So um, with that, I will turn it back over to um, Phyllis, who will help to facilitate the questions. All right, thanks, Kevin. Uh, we do have a couple really good questions. One, uh, uh, it continues to uh, be evident that compensatory education is an issue for many. So uh, this question asks, uh, and I'll toss it to Julie, is compensatory education a federal requirement required in the actual law, the IDEA or the regulations? Well, that's a really good question. I actually had a little bit of an argument about that this week um, with an advocate who was insisting that the law defined it the way that she was using it, that IDEA had a definition in there and it was the way she was using it. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, compensatory education is not defined in the IDEA. It's not a term in IDEA. It was a court created remedy for a violation of free appropriate public education. And I think the confusion and why it keeps coming up was started with, I think it was the initial guidance letter from the US Department of Education, where they used the term compensatory services, which generally strikes the heart of all educators because it's a very popular remedy that's been sought in lawsuits. And so everybody starts getting on that compensatory language train and start arguing that every child with a disability because they did not get services during this period that were exactly like they should have in their IEPs, that when they return, they're all entitled to comp ed. And there is actually a lawsuit that was filed a couple of weeks ago in the state of Hawaii that assumes essentially that all children in the state of Hawaii were denied FAPE and are entitled to compensatory services. And I completely disagree with that. Again, I think you all did a great job describing what it is and what it isn't, but the bottom line is we have to stay the course that we engaged in good faith reasonable efforts to provide FAPE over the summer, and so we're not talking about comp ed. Now, it may be that some services, summertime services to prevent, as Kevin called it, the COVID slide, whatever, you know, schools can start thinking about whether they want to do that, but that's not the same thing as compensatory education services. I also heard yesterday, just since we're on this topic, a question was uh, presented to me several times this morning already. Someone had provided some information about asking families right now, just sending out a letter to them to ask them if they want comp ed for their children. And I don't think that's a very wise thing to do because that's an IEP team decision in terms of what the student needs when the student 
returns to school in the fall and what that COVID impact actually was. All right, thank you, Julie. Uh, really appreciate that clarification. Myrna, this next question is for you. Uh, do they have any idea when we could expect the recommendations to be approved from Congress? Actually, the answer is, as we often say in the legal world, I don't know. <laughs> That's unclear. Um, actually, we don't know when the next package will be. As I said, they're, they're working right now on another package that we think may surface uh, in, middle of, in the middle of May. The problem is, is that we don't know what's going to be in that package. It could have no education funding at all. Uh, it could have nothing to do with uh, flexibility under any of the laws. Uh, so it's all really up to the advocates uh, and Case is working really hard. I've already got several appointments next week uh, with members of the staff of the education committees in Congress to talk more in depth about our recommendations, which actually heartens me because they actually reached out to me after the secretary's report and they saw our response and press release that Case sent out. Uh, and I, that that gives that heartens me to think that maybe there is actually some serious discussion going on. But unfortunately, I can't give you any indication of what the timing will look will look like. But one other thing I will add is the difficulty in Congress meeting right now. You probably have heard in in the national news that the Senate is expected to come back tomorrow. Excuse me, on Monday. I forget what day it is. Too. It's Friday, isn't it? On Monday. And the House was also slated to come back on Monday, but now based on the recommendations, I mean, that's 435 people in the House of Representatives, and you can imagine distancing and all the staff that entails and whatever, and there have been a number of cases of the virus already on Capitol Hill, both in staff, in personal offices and among the Capitol Police who service the whole uh, whole of Congress. So we're we're very up in the air about even when there will be the next vote in Congress. So I'm sorry to say I can't give you any more specific information right now. All right. Thank you, Myrna. We've had a couple of questions about statewide assessments. Uh, we are running low on time, but I just want to say to to those people, uh, statewide assessments, the guidance has come out from the ESSA or regarding the ESSA. You need to look to your state departments for those answers. Those decisions have been handed down to uh, state departments of education. So I would encourage you if you have questions about your statewide assessments that you go there for your answers. There has been a couple questions about what do I do in my district? How do I respond if a parent um, says, why aren't you opening your doors when the governor or the um, uh, health officials or someone else is saying it's okay to open? Uh, I think you have to look to your district superintendent for that response as to how you should respond on behalf of your school district. So I, I, I'm sorry that we can't speak for you in your district or your state. That's why we continue to say, look at the guidance that's being offered. Um, uh, it has to be applicable. Uh, the question has to be applicable to where the answer comes from. So uh, please continue to uh, look at our website as we continue to provide guidance and answer as many questions as we possibly can. I also want to uh, direct your attention to our next webinar, which will be May the 12th, um, and it will be planning for success post-COVID-19. The registration is posted on the front page of the website at this uh, point in time. We'll be sending out some e-blasts for registration as well. Uh, we are so excited. We have some great ideas, things you need to be thinking about as we will move into at some point in time reopening our school doors. Thank you for joining us today for our seventh webinar, uh, webinar um, on COVID-19. Um, we thank you all for supporting CASE. Stay tuned for some upcoming activities, again, by checking in on our website. Uh, thank you again.